Thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate you joining us today. This is Nora O'Brien leading the team of Connect Consulting Services, um, talking about tools for managing COVID-19 response. Um, we are hoping today to give you some ideas about how to deal with um, this extraordinary event in our lives that is impacting not just the US, not just one region as with normal with most disasters, it only affects us one part of the world. In this case, it's across the entire world. So we're gonna talk a little about COVID-19, give some of the sobering facts that unfortunately we're seeing on the news constantly um, and moving into the future and giving you some ideas about what to deal with how to, how to plan for your business, how to plan for your school, how to plan for making sure that you stay in business after this event is uh, come and gone. So um, let's move into, um, great. Now we're gonna talk about how to ask a question. Um, hopefully many of you are very familiar with the webinar system, but you've got a control panel where you can actually ask a question. So you have two opportunities you can, um, we, ask it you put questions in the um, asking that you ask a question in um, the question tool and not the on the chat um, do you have the slides the slides are actually there was a question that already came in and there is a handout section and that's where the slides are so you can view them later and we'll also send out the recording afterwards um, after the presentation all right, so that was our presentation. That's our agenda for today. We want to be able to support you. Here's our trainers that we have online with us. So I'm Nora O'Brien. I am the CEO of Connect Consulting Services. Um, master's degree in public affairs uh, with a concentration of disaster emergency management. I'm a certified emergency manager um, and also led an H1N, H1N1 pandemic response for the California Primary Care Association. Um, they've also done wildfires, hurricane responses, etc. Um, Karen, you want to enjoy tell you a little bit about your background? Certainly. My name is Karen Garrison. I'm director of aging services for Connect, and I my background is I have directed multiple community-based and clinical aging services programs, including case management, senior centers, national service programs, assisted living with a focus on Alzheimer's care and disease and disabled adults. Um, and so my background has always been uh, running programs for older adults and disabled adults, mostly in the San Francisco Bay Area and um, have been with Connect for about two and a half years. Sure, hi everyone. Um, I'm Lori Benblatt. I am a disaster and emergency readiness specialist. Um, I've worked in multiple disasters and emergencies throughout uh, the US and territories as well as globally. Um, my work spans from um, response through recovery and preparedness. And my background is uh, in as a mental health clinician and public health. So I kind of work in the intersection of those two within the disaster and emergency fields. Okay, great. Thanks very much. We really appreciate it. Okay. Um, one other person we also want to introduce ourselves, uh, we want her to introduce herself. Amanda Cooper is our newest team member. Do you want to talk a little bit about the work that you, you're going to be doing for us? Sure. sure. Um, Amanda Cooper, I have a master's in public health, and um, I was an emergency manager, public health emergency manager for the state of Alaska. And most recently, I um, served as a lead advisor for FEMA, where I worked uh, multiple disasters, including Hurricane Harvey, um, the campfire in paradise uh, a year, a little over a year ago. Um, and I have joined the team as a planning specialist and I'm currently working on a pandemic planning guide right now that we hope to have released soon um, to help organizations um, kind of develop and think about things they need to do to prepare for a pandemic. Great, thanks so much, Amanda. We really appreciate it. Happy to have you. So I'm gonna um, this particular, this may or may not be helpful to you. This is not, we're not trying to make light of the situation of, of the whole situation related to the pandemic, but Semper Gumby is, we're just going to introduce you to an emergency management term that is, we always have to be flexible because we're again in extraordinary times. 
in disaster management, you know, in dealing with this. Because as I said, in most disasters, you're only affecting, it's only affecting one part of the world. So the other part of the world can actually can provide what's called mutual aid to, you know, that area that's, that's un, the unaffected area can support the affected area. Because with um, a global pandemic, we're all sort of dealing with the same uh, resource shortages and dealing with all the things that we have to do um, to manage this event. And it's also changing every minute. And so that flexibility is crucial because um, just when you think you have it together, a new light of information comes out, whether there's resource shortages or whether there's um, new uh, stay-at-home orders that's been ordered by your governor or whatever the thing is, um, there's always new information and sometimes it's information overload. But that understanding, that flexibility, you kind of really, um, we're in the situation of gone are the days like you knew what you were going to do when you got up in the morning and and it's going to be, uh, it's going to be different from this point forward. You're going to get to um, a system, we're going to get to a point, point of, um, of new normal, which uh, Lori's going to talk about in a minute, but um, it's a crucial, it, it's just important to know that this flexibility is going to allow for that resiliency and allow us to bounce back and uh, thrive after this event that's that's so extraordinary. Okay. All right. And I also want to talk a little bit about this whole process of an OODA loop. Some of you might be very familiar with this process. This might be completely new to you. But the whole point in managing a disaster, the whole process of an OODA loop is an opportunity. This hot link here um, on the top of the of the bullets here is just a just kind of an ex explanation of what it is. It's a it's a link to that some more information about it. But this is a term that actually came out of fighter pilots in the Air Force. They often do all sorts of maneuvers and they never quite know which way, which way is up. And, um, and what we found is that, so they came up with this idea of an OODA loop because they constantly have to make split second decisions that might make, you know, you know depend on what that decision may be, might have disastrous or fortuitous um, results. And it's referred to as a loop because you're going to have to make a decision as things information changes. So with if you're in a fighter pilot and you're sitting in, um, you know, and you're going into into a, a, a tailspin, you have to observe what's going on. You have to say, what is going on? What what is that information that's coming at me, whether it's on the news or my Twitter feed or, um, you know, in, in my inbox, or my email, et cetera. So you want to observe what's going on. And that orientation is, how, what is that information and how does that impact me, my, my clients, my patients, my, um, my students in my school, my business, you know, my family, myself. How does that orient of that information that I'm getting in? And then I'm going to have to make a decision or a series of decisions based on that information. And then I take some action. Now, as again, as new information comes out, um, you're going to have to make decisions. And sometimes you might make a decision one minute and 15 minutes later make a completely different decision, um, you know, completely different decision. And that's okay. Um, because new as new information becomes to light, you're going to have to repeat this process, and it might feel like it's an overwhelming process. But and, and also that question that that decision you make one minute might be completely opposite. But that's okay as new information. But understanding this OODA loop and managing this crisis means that you're always going to kind of like take in that information, orient to how it how it impacts your environment make a decision and take an action. Um, and this is something that's classic. And since, because you know, it worked well with fighter pilots, it's actually been used through many uh, business communities and used in government. And it's really, really helpful how to manage that crisis and how to see what information. And, and some of the actions that you take might have long ranging um, impacts and some might be very short term, but understanding that then you've got to make some decisions. And sometimes the decision will be made for you if you don't take action. So that OODA loop is important to understand. Um, the other thing we wanted to share with you is what are the uh, World Health Organization pandemic phases? 
So we have all been, you know, glued to our phones, you know, phones, tablets, email, all of that, TV, you know, TV, et cetera, to look at what's going on and we're trying to understand how COVID-19 really has happened so quickly, you know, our lives were very different four months ago than they are today, even a month ago, even a week ago. You know, we give a red, th this presentation a week ago and things have significantly changed even since then. Um, and so again, it's a lot of information and you're just trying to do the best you can. But these who, who pandemic phases are important because we're, we're now, with, we're obviously past the one through three we're moving into the widespread human transmission. Um, that's kind of where we're at right now. But this, you've heard a lot of term, you've heard of the, uh, uh, everyone's been hearing about flatten the curve. We don't wanna see a rise of cases. And if we don't change our social distancing, then if we don't change, um, if we don't have people, you know, please people do not go to bars, restaurants, please do not go to the to the park, please not go to the beaches, don't go to places where other people are, because the whole point is the more the people interact with each other, the more this particular this particular strain of, of uh, pandemic is really, um, you know, this this coronavirus is very deadly, unfortunately. But the, the other thing that's important for you to know about the pandemic phases is that if we're able to, as we refer to as flatten the curve and the peak of cases that we don't want to see, we don't want to see more death, we don't want to see more rise of cases, and we don't want to see not even just the, the, the fallout from all of those things of schools closing, you know, businesses failing, all those things. We don't want to see those. But what's going to happen is at some point, and this time frame is different, it's different for every kind of event, but in this case, you're going to see that people are at some point going to want to go back to normal and go back to their regular lives, right? But if that happens, what's going to happen is that people go, oh, you know, we're fine. I'm fine. I didn't get sick. I might have been, I, you know, I'm okay. I'm fine. Then what's going to happen is when people go back to their, their lives again and they, you know, schools reopen, businesses reopen, things come back to normal. And then you're going to see what's referred to as a post peak. So I can tell you in this particular um, phase, we think that this particular time frame might be a year to a year and a half. And that might be really sobering news for some of you that want to see this over quickly. I really wish that was the case, but you know, I'm not an expert in, uh, in I'm not a scientist, I'm not an expert in, um, you know, but I am I, I'm an, I'm a huge expert in uh, disaster management and understanding, knowing that's a year and a half, our lives are going to be completely upended. And knowing that now helps to, 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 to plan for the future. So I just want to share with you those pandemic phases. As I said, I mentioned I um, had some lessons learned from the H1N1 pandemic. So I was at the California Primary Care Association representing the nonprofit community clinics. Um, and there was over a thousand clinics that we represented. When there was one laboratory confirmed case of H1N1 in uh, 2009, it was at a community health center. Um, so it was at one of the clinics we represented. And um, so we, you know, so it was a very, it was definitely a pandemic because we had sustained human human transmission. Um, we did have the whole issue of supply chains of personal protection equipment. We're seeing those exact things happen. We had those things happen in 2009. Um, and, um, but before the seven years before uh, H1N1 happened, um, I sat in a lot of those meetings with Department of Public Health and um, EMS and hospitals and skilled nursing facilities, and we kind of talked about what was the worst case. And the worst case was we're going to see a lot more, um, you know, we're, I'm sorry to say more deaths. We're going to see more, um, more disease, more morbidity. We're going to see lots of other things. In H1N1's case, the, the lucky thing was, yes, we had 1.6 million cases across the world. That seems a significant number um, over a, a year, because it wasn't also, it didn't happen you know, right away. It was over a year. 
um, we had 247,000 deaths, I believe, um, which were which is a really a, a sad, sad number. But we it but this particular COVID-19 is much more deadly. Um, it was um, for the most part, we didn't close schools. We didn't have the huge social distancing, stay at home orders that we did that we're seeing now. Um, but I can tell you on H1N1, supply chains were impacted. So if you are looking for that PPE, the personal protection equipment, you know, if the masks, gloves, gowns, all of that stuff, the, the supply chain happened, you know, breaks, you know, broke then and, and is breaking now. We also had unclear guidance um, for healthcare worker protection measures. So again, we were representing community health centers and we had the CDC had one set of recommendations how to protect those healthcare workers. And then State Department of Public Health in California had a completely different set of, you know, a little bit different. And so then there was confusion. And then some county public health also had another set of recommendations. So that just made it difficult. Um, okay. The other thing, social distancing was encouraged. This also, the other thing that was different about H1N1 versus now, this was this was an outpatient driven event. It was not hospital based because it was not as deadly. It was not, um, and so the hospitals were not completely overrun. Primary care was in, in 2009. In addition, it took, we all got lucky. We got, within six months, we had a vaccine. In COVID-19, we're not going to be as lucky. It's going to be over a year. And how many people and how many um, people lives are going to be impacted before that vaccine is available? So those are just some lessons learned from 2009. Um, and then, you know, we've been seeing this. We, I actually, you know, we think, I think it's important to share a mess of public messages like this. This is what we call a risk communication message. You know, I love this. This is from City of Round Rock. Um, you know, wash your hands like you just got done slicing jalapenos for a batch of nachos and you need to take your contacts out. You know, people want to make light of it. It's not making light of the point at all. It's like, it's just whatever's going to relate to people that, you know, say, oh yeah, okay, I understand. This is important. You know, cover your cover your cough, stay home, you know, stay home if you're sick, et cetera, that sort of thing. Get help, ask for help, wash your hands, those kinds of things. Um, we think that this important messaging um, over and over again is referred to as a risk communication message is just important to know. And Karen's going to talk a little bit now about an update on where we are with cases and how it's impacted certain communities. Right. Hello, everybody. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you're located. Um, this is Karen Garrison, Director of Aging Services. So this is actually a very big moving target. Um, these numbers are um, actually from two days ago and then yesterday. So I kind of wanted to show worldwide where we are. Um, worldwide right now, well, yesterday, about midday, we were at 409. Um, that's 409,000 people, you know, uh, who have contracted COVID-19. Um, actually, right now, it's probably 439, 440. So these numbers are moving quickly. Um, and in terms of death, uh, 18,274, which is actually yesterday's numbers, uh, we're almost at 20K today. So these numbers, uh, seven days ago, I've been tracking numbers for the last two or three weeks. And seven, week, seven days ago, we were adding about 5,000 new cases a day, and now we're up to 50, over 50,000 cases a new day. Uh, new cases a day. So that's a huge trend line that we need to really look at. Um, the three top um, largest largest population um, countries that have COVID, obviously China, uh, they've managed to flatten the curve um, and their new cases are actually, you know, uh, we're not hearing about those new cases in terms of uh, the accelerated numbers um, that they were you know, January and February, their numbers were astronomically speaking, and now they're actually much, much more slowed. Italy is uh, <clears throat> was 63,000 the day before, um, a little bit less, but they're, uh, you know, notice the death rates versus the, K, the transmission rates. It's much different. And so in Italy, you're seeing a 
almost a 0.09 death rate to that population as opposed to China, which is about a 0.45 death rate. Um, and that does have a, a big difference on how health systems are handling intensive care patients, how community outreach is happening. Um, so there's lots and lots of data that will be had after this. But right now we're kind of working with raw numbers um, in the United States. We're actually catching up to Italy. Um, and so these numbers have jumped three or 4,000 cases just from yesterday. Um, obviously the hotspots in, um, are in New York City, Manhattan specifically. They have over 15,000 cases just in, in Manhattan uh, proper. Um, we've, we've still got New Jersey, California, and those are emerging trend lines. So we need to kind of keep, a, keep an eye on that not only on total numbers, but we also need to look at where those hotspots are. Okay, we're gonna move right on to the next one. This is my, my, one of my favorite is that communities are, despite the fact that we're actually in a, in this pandemic, people are reaching out to support their elders and others that actually need that help, um, you know, who are isolated and at risk. So obviously I think the big message here is don't bring it home to your elders. Um, many, many people live in homes where the, it's an extended family. And so you might have an elderly, uh, elderly person living with grandchildren and adult children. So it's really important. So these are some of the ways that people have reached out to support these, these at-risk isolated seniors or others. Um, supermarkets, have now put in senior only times, so maybe seven to nine before they open for regular work. They only allow seniors or people with medical issues or pregnant women to come in and shop so that that social distancing can really happen. In Ireland, there was a hashtag, uh, a, Twitter, a Twitter movement to uh, reach out to offer assistance to um, run errands, to go shopping, to whatever, um, to help those people who are self-isolating. Um, I've heard about a postcard campaign that allows vulnerable elders to request errands such as shopping, which is great. Again, it's those communities pulling together in creative ways, either online or through their community centers as extensions that are helping that. Italian people in, in lockdown I've heard there's big sing-alongs happening in Venice and in Rome, and it's a way for people to share, but do it in a more distant way. And lastly, uh, there's, I, uh, there's a new thing where it's like a drive-by wedding and birthday celebrations um, so that people can still participate in these social activities, but they can do them from afar. I've heard about birthday parades for 82-year-olds, and it's kind, of, it's kind of fun, and I think that Part of what's going to get us through this time is that we have to be creative and we have to continue to be social in ways that are safe and appropriate. Okay. All right. You might have heard about shelter in place. I've got to say we are in California, so we're under a mandatory shelter in place order. Over 100,000 people in the United States, 100 million people. I keep getting that number wrong. Sorry, over 100 million people in the U.S. are in shelter-in-place orders. Now, you might think that that's a uniform order. It actually isn't. And so when you do the research, every state is actually approaching it slightly differently. So some might need directives, might be that would be a best practice for you. But in other states, like in California, they are very serious, only essential services. They are, they're not enforcing it in terms of, um, you know, uh, I'm, they're not going to arrest you or fine you, but they might if you're it's really egregious. They have the power to do that. So again, not all shelter-in-place orders are the same. It seems like every day new states in um, actually actually add shelter-in-place orders. So um, not sure if they're going to do a national shelter-in-place order, but we'll just see. Shelter-in-place orders tend to be for a few weeks. Right now, they're two or two to three weeks are what most of them are for. With the with the codicil that you those might be extended. So I think all the states are trying to decide is two or three weeks enough. 
Also, most of the schools in these states, all the schools in these states are closed. So we've got a lot of kids that are at home that are not at school getting the virus. And so they're all sheltering in place. And we're hoping that that will ultimately really flatten the um, curve. Will shelter in place orders continue? Well, it's very hard to know, but I think that will be a state by state right. issue. So we wanted to say, as we said, we're based in California and Governor Newsom did, uh, did the stay at home order. But I wanted to let you know that we're open for business and here to serve you. And it's the point is, you know, as much as we all love you, but we, you know, under this, we're essentially essential service. So uh, under his actual order, it says workers performing security, incident management, emergency operations functions on or behalf of healthcare entities, including healthcare coalitions, who cannot practically work remotely. We work best, so we are in the office. We are we are doing our best to uh, practice social distancing as best we can. We are we are being safe as well, but um, that's um, it's something that is important for us um, to share with you. Okay, I'm now going to get over to Lori to talk about the mental health piece because it's that's just as crucial. A lot of people want to just think about their physical health, but their mental health piece is just a, just as critical during this tough time. Hi everyone, um, thanks for the presentation so far, Nora and Karen. Um, as Nora just mentioned, I'm going to talk about um, the behavioral and mental health impacts and what we can do to take care of ourselves. Um, I think so far there's been a lot of information, some of it scary, a lot of it probably known, some of it maybe unknown. One of um, the things that we always say in disaster and emergency field is that the more prepared you are, the better your behavior and mental health impacts are in the short and long term. So um, understanding not only the information, but also how we as humans will integrate that information and how that impacts us helps to normalize our experience. So um, these are some of the examples of what we might be feeling are um, affects us emotionally, such as like we might feel some shock, anger, we might get more, we might be more irritable, we might feel helpless or hopeless, um, feeling of loss of control. Um, our thoughts might seem like they're out of control, we might lose our concentration, we might have a change, thank you, <laughs> we might have a change in our memories, um, we might worry more, and um, we also might experience more fatigue. Um, sometimes we don't recognize how intricately um, integrated our sleep and our uh, behavior and mental health are, but um, often we can experience some sleep disturbances, um, hyperarousal, uh, uh, somatic complaints. And then we also might, um, I mean, social withdrawal might um, it be experienced a little different here, but as everyone around us is looking to technology and connecting um, with people online and through all these different platforms, it is normal and okay if you're feeling like you don't want to engage in that and you might be a little bit more withdrawn um, we might have some more relationship di difficulty. We might be more on edge. And also, um, there's we usually see an increase in domestic violence and other violence during these times. Most of this is normal. And also, I can't emphasize enough that it is age dependent. So for parents out there looking um, to your kids, some of these might be experienced differently. They might be manifested differently and same as we look to older adults. So then in our next slide, um, we look at when when some of these reactions go from the quote unquote normal to when we wanna seek out help. Um, if we see an increase in substance use or um, in depression, if we see changes in eating where people might be overeating or, or not hungry or not eating, um, against we might see an unhealthy anger and i emphasize that because we sometimes associate anger as a like not okay to experience but anger is an emotion and it is okay and it's quote unquote normal um it's when we have unhealthy anger that we tend to 
want to be able to seek help to how to mitigate that a little bit. Um, when we have trauma symptoms, some either some someone might be experiencing a traumatic experience now for the first time. Often we have multiple experiences that kind of feed off each other, um, and that might feed into uh, more distress and more um, traumatic experiences. We might have complicated grief. Um, and then also, sometimes we just want general support, which is okay. These are really trying times and there is no shame. Um, a lot of times mental health is often, often comes with a stigma, but we, we like support, whether it's reaching out to your friends or whether it's looking online to a lot, um, some of the counselors that are doing telehealth sessions now, that is encouraged and okay. So when another piece of preparing and educating ourselves is um, as we look to the next slide, there's generally a pathway for what we experience. So some of those factors I just talked about might um, contribute to people to people's distress in different ways. Um, with this particular pandemic, we had a warning, a slow growing warning, but we were able to prepare in some ways, but it also gave us time to feel those anxious, those um, the anxiety and, and uh, negative impacts of it. And so when the threat came close to home, these are different steps that we might experience that like, uh, that um, influence how we're going to experience the the behavior and mental health impacts. So we go through these warnings and these threats, and we might start to feel more anxious and more stressed. Um, we start taking inventory about what our, where are our friends, where are our family members, um, inventory as far as food and supplies go, and that all influences what we're experiencing inside. At some point, as we're seeing now in a lot of communities, you moving forward, we go into the honeymoon phase where we're seeing people come together to um, try to help our neighbors, help the elderly. There's a lot of feeding programs going on that are very localized and, and global. Um, we see people donating masks. I've seen a lot of like really creative uh, innovations of these sewing circles who are trying to create masks for people, for people in the healthcare field. So all sorts of different community cohesions. At some point, it is very normal and expected for people to start to feel a little bit overwhelmed and overburdened by all of this. And we, it's it kind of goes into this uh, deep disillusionment phase to feel like, when is this gonna be over? And like Nora said, this is prolonged. And so the more we can prepare, and kind of piece out the amount of, of, of engagement that we're doing and take stock of how you are handling it all and not necessarily compare ourselves to our neighbors. We all have a different limit and different capacity for how much we can do at any given time. And so the more we take stock of it, the longer we'll be able to be engaged and help each other and help ourselves. So this from the honeymoon down to that bottom peak, it's kind of stretched out in this situation. But then as we then like come to like the bottom of the phase, if you can remember back to Nora's um, slide, when we go to the end of the pandemic phase, we are all working through our grief. The impacts really start to um, be visible. We start to see the loss. We start to see how people are more connected. Also, there's some positive things coming out of this um and we start to build the sense of resilience and we come to a new normal and as both nora and karen mentioned um this is impacting everyone globally and um we are we don't know what will what the new normal will look like but we do know that the more we prepare and the more we can help ourselves um with our emotions the better off we're gonna be. So when we look on um, the next slide, looking into how we can prepare our organizations and our businesses as far as continuity goes, um, those of you who are here are leaders or um, ahead of a business, people are looking up to you. And so how you mentor and how you lead is gonna have a big impact on your team overall. Um, you can't do everything. Um, it's impossible. So learning how to delegate is really important. Having a liaison or dedicated coordinator to maybe communicate with your staff is important. Um, understanding 
a clear communication structure, which Nora will talk about later. Um, being able to squash rumors that your staff might be hearing and any misinformation just to um, for their ease, uh, their ease of mind, uh, having helping to organize structure and routines for your staff is also important. Engaging chats, engaging like different. Um, we have this like chat going in one of um, my contracts where we have like all these different memes and humorous jokes going just to keep people engaged and feeling light. Um, being able to promote supportive activities and health, maybe um, sending out links for different physical exercises online or yoga or meditation, or again, just bringing humor as much as we can. And not to, not to say that we're not all feeling this, but being able to engage socially is really important. Um, again, monitor, monitoring your own leadership style. Um, people want to help and volunteer. And so ask your team members, ask your staff if people want to help each other. Um, and then again, preparing for the after effects of everything will also help people feel a little bit calmer and a little bit better about what their individual and like team outcomes will be. Um, I like to use the term physical distancing instead of social distancing, just because being isolated is hard enough, but we have these platforms that we should take advantage of to engage if, you know, as much as you can. So when we move to the next slide, um, not only is it important for you to care for yourself as a leader, but caring for yourself um, as an individual, encouraging this in your staff members. So again, physical distancing versus social distancing being able to hold realistic expectations and acceptance. This is a hard situation for every single person worldwide. And I think it's, um, even if things are hard, it's we can manage our stress the more we know and the more we prepare. Um, it's also really important to not overdo social media and not overdo the news. Um, a lot of times those, those platforms are created or have become some like some avenue to create stress and to create panic. So we want to make sure that we're limiting our exposure to that. If you um, if you are religious or spiritual, use that community to help uh, to help create your spiritual and faith based support. Again, routines, volunteering are really important. A lot of times people uh, talk about never having time for self-care practice or physical exercise practice. And now is a really good time. Um, while we're all home, we can take five minutes uh, a day or a few minutes at a time. Um, even telling yourself every day some, some positive daily reminders, some, something positive can help. It can help change these negative thought patterns that we tend to go into. Um, Again, preparing for the after the distancing and after the isolation is really important. A lot of times when people experience um, loss, we feel a little bit empty. We don't really know our lives have changed, our routines have changed. And so being able to prepare for that also helps us when we're coming out of the pandemic. And then what's really important is to always be gentle on yourself. These emotions and behaviors are normal we're all experiencing it together and um i always like to say to keep a sense of humor and really important we can only help those around us if we help ourselves first um yep yeah, thank, thank you you, thank you so talk. much Lori. those were really important words the understanding of that self-care um is so crucial at this time and emergency managers tend to be the worst about self-care and that's why we have what's called a safety uh, liaison, um, a safety officer in our incident command system because people are forget to go to the bathroom and forget to eat. And you know, when's the last time you ate? Last time you had a nap or slept? So that that's important. So I'm going to talk a little bit about business continuity planning for your healthcare organization. Again, some of you are in California or in those areas where there have been you know shelters in place orders have been. Um, have been orders. Um, obviously, you can't necessarily do patient care from home. Um, you, that's not certainly a possibility. So, 
Um, we want you to activate your incident command system to manage the incident. And if you don't have one, um, we'll share some information with you on incident command. Um, the having an, an incident command is a system that is a worldwide standard for managing instances, whether it's a small incident, whether it's like a water main break in your building that only affects your building or your company to a worldwide pandemic. It's, it's that's how scalable and flexible it is. So we're huge fans of incident command. Um, we coordinate medical care with your local public health agency hospital. Now is the time to have those relationships with your healthcare coalition, your skilled nursing facility. And the whole point, all of pandemic of this pandemic response will be, you might, you're gonna hear this a lot over the next couple of years is medical surge capacity. So let's say they're gonna be asking you questions. Can you treat people in your parking? Can you do screenings in your parking lot? Can you uh, do patient care in an alternate setting? Can you take patients that are not nearly as bad you know, in the hospital? Can you take people? So that all that care coordination is just gonna be crucial right now. Obviously adhered to standard contact um, airborne precautions and the use of uh, eye protection and hand, hand hygiene. Um, you know, we, we say cover your cough, you know, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. It really, really does. It can uh, reduce the spread. That personal protection equipment, we know that there are sh supply shortages. We know this is an issue. We know that there's a lot of people working on it. Um, we're actually working with a couple of vendors ourselves. So there might be um, some opportunities for uh, personal protection equipment that we might be making, be able to make available to our clients. So yeah, as, as that situation unfolds, it seems like it's every 10 minutes a new piece of information, um, but we'll keep you posted on that. Manage that visitor access and move it within your facility. Um, having people that you don't know, have they been exposed? Really limited visitors. You, you really want um, to keep only those, those um, patient facing people in, in your facility and the patients and people that are, and that's a tough situation. You know, if you're a hospital and people want to be with their loved ones, we understand, but it means that it's going to continue to spread. Um, also training your staff on healthcare um, personnel on infectious control procedures. Um, and it's not just washing your hands. What is your procedure? What do you use gowns, then gloves, and how you don and doff and all of that? Are your staff trained on that? Have they been tested for, um, for N95 masks? When do you use a surgical mask? When do you use an N95 mask? When is necessary? And then do you have non-patient facing staff? Can they work from home? Whether it's they do payroll or IT, or can they be doing double duty and they can now do something that's non-patient facing, but that also supports your operation and serve in a, in a different role. So these are some continuity things to keep the patients flowing. We understand, but also um, still stay in business. Um, if, for those of you that are schools, I think the tough thing is, you know, we've definitely seen a lot of school closures in California and other states. Um, online learning options uh, for students and uh, staff coordination and parent communication. Again, that incident management team, we talked about the incident management um, system of who's in charge, who's going to be next in charge. Talk about orders of succession. It can't just be one person. Very much what Lori said is that we have, um, you know, what you have, what Lori said is that you can't just be one person, you know, standing against this pandemic on your own. You really need to delegate and having an incident management team because uh, at some point you're going to want to go home, take a shower or be home and and you want to get away from that situation. You need to give the delegate that, that uh, authority to somebody else within your organization. You know, also developing really strong communication tools to communicate about open school clo close and openings. Um, also monitoring the mental health of the staff and the students. Um, my, I just got a text from my, um, one of my, my son's um, teachers yesterday saying, and asking the question, how is your child? How is he doing? And does he have access to these things? And how can we help? That for me as a parent, went a long way in understanding that the school district, as large as it is in Sacramento, um, 
care and this and this uh, and this teacher cares about my child and the education him. He is about to go to college in the fall, and he has to figure out how to take AP tests. Sorry, I'm just doing a little uh, sharing here. I have to figure out how to take four AP tests online. That's going to be a tough situation. And we all have tough, tough situations moving forward. But continuity is having a system and a process um, and, and a way to manage the incident. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about business. Um, we have some business folks on the loan that just, whether it's, you know, you're running a coffee shop or whatever it is, um, you ident need to ident, again, going back to an who's in charge, what decisions need to be made, how to stay afloat, developing a use and communication channels to figure out, are you open, are you closed, are you, um, are you doing takeout orders if you're a restaurant um, only, are, and that communication channels are really important. Do you have a work from home policy already identified? Do you know how to monitor staff? Um, if they are working from home, are they being efficient and effective even in through this challenging time? And figuring out, you know, cancel, obviously you're canceling personal in-person meetings. Many people are, but the, some of those are still happening. So you want to evaluate as new information comes to light, going back to that OODA loop uh, process, as new information comes to light, is that really a good time? Should I be shaking hands? My guess is, my, my recommendation is no. Um, the other thing is plan for alternate staffing patterns. Um, is if there's school closures, it means that your staff and their kids are home, and some of them are of school age that maybe you don't want to leave them home when they're seven years old. My guess is so your staff may not be able to come to work. So figure out a different way of your core business that you can do with less staff or a different pattern, an alternate staffing pattern. Um, or they may themselves might be sick or they might be have family members that are sick. So your staff, you're gonna have different staffing patterns. Um, figure out alternate business process for and, and your essential business functions. That's something we do all the time with uh, business continuity planning, identify what are your critical business functions, what has to come up, what are the priorities when things need to get done in order for you to stay in business. The other thing is you've been hearing a lot about supply chain around medical supplies, but you're also going to have the same issues moving into the future. Supply chain around goods and services, that may, and maybe raw materials if you're a manufacturer, but it might just be IT services or, or um, other things that you need, um, those goods and services. Look for alternate vendors, look for alternate goods and service uh, providers, because those things are going to be different, um, and they may already be different. Um, and, but if you have something, let's say you're a raw, you know, you're a manufacturer and you have a raw material, you can't get access to. That might mean that you can't stay in business. Um, also, think about alternate IT access. Get a line of credit now. Do not wait. And you're like, oh, I'm looking at three months ahead. I'm fine. We don't quite know into the future. So, and we're not again, we're not gloom and doomers at all. We're just trying to give you practical advice moving into the future, how people can help. And then do you have a business plan? If you don't, now's the time to look at it, update it, what's different, what was done, you know, what was six months ago, what was five years ago, and now we're, maybe you're gonna do things like, maybe you're gonna do things more e-commerce. Maybe you're, and this is the time if it's slower for you to develop new tools, for you to develop new um, ebooks it's maybe it's time for you to develop new software as a service products and you're going to product development because you're not able to be it's not going to be revenue facing so those lines of credit would be really helpful so we do want to hear we have some questions so we want to hear from you um yes we'll be sending out the slides that was one of the questions oh fair amount of questions okay so let's all right we have one question someone read them yes we will be sending out the slides um we will make sure that you guys have the access to the recording the complete slide set um and other resources that we've talked about in this webinar the email should go out tomorrow Explain the important thing to compare in terms of the death rate versus the. Uh, I can take that one. Okay. <clears throat> so basically, 
if you look at um, any of the websites, uh, our data actually came from the N uh, COV19 Live website, which is an aggregate website looking at CDC, WHO, and other um, sites. And it's I think it's very interesting when you look at the difference between the transmitted cases versus the death rate. I think the uh, data is not in yet. Part of that, I'm sure, is in terms of what their health system is, um, how quickly those cases became um, emergent, how quickly those resources were brought into bear. So I think it's, it's something that is very interesting, but I think the, um, the, the word is not out yet on what those differences in death rates versus transmission rates. And um, I think that's the kind of epidemiological analysis that will be done post outbreak. Um, but I think looking at that, um, you know, it's very interesting when you look at Italy versus the United States in terms of transmitted cases, we're actually coming, coming up to their transmission rate uh, number, but our death rate is far lower. So I think so much of that is about time when you get it, when, it, when you're impacted, when you need services. So it's, it's kind of a moving target every day. Hope also, uh, Karen, I'm, I'm gonna add one more thing. Part of what they're, so they are developing this test that can um, retroactively test antibodies yeah. because yeah. right now we, we um, I mean, as we all know all over, there are not enough tests and it's impossible for us to get an accurate count Hopefully, as this test gets developed, and um, it's not—it's not really. A, we, we're not going to use it right now, but as time goes on, we'll be able to retroactively um, collect that data and see what that what the real or extrapolated transmission rate is. But at this point, I mean, it's unfortunate, but we hear this all the time in the public health world: is that we we just don't know, um, and that is just more of like needing to accept that but we will know and we will be able to have then in the future really prepare for that accordingly yeah another Thank question you. is um how do you deal with healthcare workers that are panicky uh a lot of them aren't coming in because they have a COVID 19 resident yes. Ooh. so that's the situation where what again what we're saying is so you need to plan for an alternate staffing pattern. You're going to have people that just aren't going to do it. Okay, there's not you can't you can't make someone come in. So you're going to have to figure that out. Can do you have to get other nurses or other you know staff from another site? Do you or a, a staffing agency? You just got to figure it out. Um, I'm not saying so. Your point is you can't you can't make them come in. You can't compel them to come in. Yeah. Um, this is Amanda, and I think something that's important when you have um, that level of panic among healthcare workers, I think what helps is to reinforce and reiterate all the precautions that the organization is taking to ensure um, that they're doing absolute best and ensuring that transmission is not occurring. Um, you could look at alternate jobs that possibly they could do within the organization that doesn't require direct contact um, with that resident or residents. So I think you have to, um, you know, this is a novel flu. Um, you have to, we don't have any anything to base these decisions on. We haven't been through this before, so you do have to be flexible. But there are other avenues you can take um, to work with, to make sure that your your clients are taken care of and that your healthcare providers feel as protected as possible. Right, that's a good point, definitely, thank you. Um, City of Angels Home Health, um, you're asking about televisits for a home health setting. Go ahead and shoot us an email. Um, our email is connect at connectconsulting.biz. Um, maybe we'll schedule a call and we can answer your questions more specifically. Uh, that's just kind of a weird um, yeah. like niche kind of question, not sure. necessarily for no problems. Audience. All right, so those are most of the questions. We actually, um, we're read, we're, we want to be respectful of your time and the hour that you spent with us. We're at the top of the hour here with a minute over. Um, we did want to let you know that um, we, um, we do actually, uh, one thing that 
Amanda is spearheading our pandemic planning guide that's going to be available very soon. So look for that. Um, we're going to include those incident response tools, more building on the business continuity planning considerations, and a guide about what to do for each recovery phase uh, within the pandemic. Um, also talk about the mental health piece because that's just so crucial because we think it's not just about the physical piece, but also the mental health piece. And then I'll include one hour of consultation to learn more. This is about who we are and what we've been, where we're around. So Connect Consulting, we've been in business since 2009. Uh, we were named Women Owned Business of the Year by the Sacramento SBA. And we do obviously pandemic planning response, emergency operations management planning, uh, business continuity planning, training, drills, um, you know, do you have an upco upcoming uh, webinar that you're looking for a speaker? We're happy to do that. We do those kinds of things all the time. And vast, vast majority of the work that we do, we can do remotely. Um, we actually continue to have, we're going to have at least a one webinar a month. And so you can go to this link and find out what our upcoming webinars are. We have a, you know, do you uh, need a speaker or a trainer? There we are. That's our contact information. We really appreciate you joining us and spending some time with us. If you have any, if you need help, book some time with us. You actually have this link here. Um, book a call and it goes, or you can go straight to our website and at the top says schedule a 30 minute call and see how we can, you know, where you're at and what we can do to maybe help you. So best of luck to you. Stay safe, stay healthy, uh, stay, use those social distancing. Uh, physical distancing um, process that um, that what that Lori mentioned, and we appreciate your the time you spent with us. Thanks so much. Take care.